All right. Welcome, welcome, everyone. I see some folks popping in here, getting settled. While we're waiting for our friends to connect, feel free to pop into the chat. Let us know where you're Zooming from. Maybe what's your big biggest win loss challenge? What what brought you with it? What brought you here today? See some of those popping in here. All right, I am currently hailing from Arizona where we got a lovely little monsoon yesterday. So although it's hot, I enjoyed the rain. How about you, Diane? I'm coming in from hot, hot, hot Austin, Texas. Uh, we are hoping for a little bit of rain over the next couple of days. It'll be our first rain since June. So we're anticipating that. <laughs> yep, I know we're in the thick of it. Hopefully towards the end of it, I suppose, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'd be curious to see where everybody else is from, if they'd like to share that. Uh, now, if you're in an undisclosed location for your own protection, just make something interesting up. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds pretty interesting to me. Um, all right, great. Well, I think we got our number here. So I'm going to go ahead and get started here. I know that we have a knowledge pack session, uh, so I don't want to waste any more time. Uh, let's go ahead and get to it. So today's workshop is all about how to win more and lose less, right? I, I think uh, win loss is often that big intimidating undertaking, but is oh so crucial to our product and business success. So um, a lot to unpack here today. My name is Callie Frisbee. I am one of the community strategists here at Pragmatic Alumni Community. I'm so excited to open this normally exclusive uh, alumni event to everyone today. Um, I think uh, as someone who got a sneak peek of, of today's discussion, I can promise you uh, that it is going to be value packed. So uh, real excited to dig in. I did want to mention that today's discussion is brought to you by the Pragmatic Alumni Community. So for those who don't know, we are home to over 26,000 product professionals. Uh, we're a place to find templates, resources, guides, peer exchanges, private events. We do it all. So um, at Pragmatic, I know we really pride ourselves on, on being that lifelong learning partner. Uh, so no matter how you train with us, everyone who joins the family gains lifetime access into our community. Um, and I know for myself, I just remain continually impressed by uh, not only the quality and abundance of knowledge of our members, but really their generosity and willingness to share it. So um, it's exciting to be a part of. But uh, so I'm delighted to host the win loss session. I did want to uh, go over uh, format quickly and some quick housekeeping items. So the session is going to be one hour in length. I'm going to be tossing over the reins to Diane, and then all attendees will be receiving a workbook that I'm going to be placing into the chat uh, so that you can follow along. We have a PowerPoint version as well as I'm going to supply a Dropbox link as a second option should you like to download it. So, uh, And I also encourage you all to stick around until the end. Diane's going to be answering questions towards the very end and also maybe supplying a reference code exclusive to our session today, should you like to reach out to her personally and talk a little bit more about some tailored win-loss guidance. So um, again, we will hold questions till the end of the session. As a reminder, please utilize that chat box as an opportunity to exchange with one another, um, and then utilize that Q&A uh, to ask any questions for Diane. So, okay, Diane, I've gabbed long enough. It is my pleasure to introduce you all to Diane Pearson. Diane has over 20 plus years of experience in product among many of her titles. Diane has been an advisor, author, speaker, pragmatic instructor, and she's also the current chief market strategist and founder of Innovate on Purpose. Uh, she's an overall product knowledge powerhouse. So um, I'm excited to, to let everyone learn today and I'm excited to learn as well. Diane, it's all yours. All right, well, thank you very much, Callie. I'm so excited for this workshop too, and I wanna second Callie's welcome. I'll start with the basics. Why do we do win-loss? What are the challenges that we face? And before that, what is win-loss anyway? We all know the saying, you win some, you lose some. The question is really why? Why do we win and why do we lose? 
can we really influence either of those if we don't have the very best product at the cheapest possible price? Well, I hope so, because Sony Betamax's product was better technology than VHS, but they lost. Kmart had lower prices than the existing competitors until Walmart came along with supply chain innovations and Kmart was decimated. Blockbuster Video had a list of challenges, pain points that their customers didn't like, and you know what happened there. There's too much avoidable losing going on. Avoiding these worst case scenarios, or better yet, becoming the market leader, is really why we do win-loss analysis. But the way a lot of companies execute win-loss activities are causing wasted cycles, team frustration, and poor results. Along those lines, here's what we at Innovate on Purpose and Pragmatic Institute have heard from your peers. These are the things that we have heard over and over again that I've heard personally over the past six years and, and before that as a, as a consultant and a leader, and Pragmatic has heard for almost 30 years. Teams don't know where to start with win-loss analysis. This is often because teams don't know what's most important to their organizations, and they end up getting overwhelmed in trying to do too much. That probably sounds familiar. Unfortunately, when they do get in front of the customer, all of this don't know what to do, not sure what to ask, we fall back on a set of really standard generic questions. Some say no budget, some say no time. And even if teams have a little bit of both of these, customers won't talk and I'm blocked by my own team. These challenges are real, they're pervasive, and their consequences are significant. Lack of focus causes teams to do more work than they have to do and still get too little in the way of actionable results. Struggles over who does what not only increases inefficiency, but it causes friction among team members. And unhappy people don't do good work. This workshop is gonna give you some proven practices to overcome these, but let's back up for a minute. What is win-loss analysis anyway? Let's make sure we're talking the same language. I'm not going to do a deep dive into teaching win-loss analysis. If you're here, you probably know what it is. But just so we're all aligned by the definition that I'm working from, the definition that I use for win-loss analysis is activities performed to discover patterns and trends in winning and losing and document your buyer's decision-making journey. The theory is if you understand buyers and how they buy, you can put assets, teams, and policies in place so you can win more and lose less. And also keep your costs at a minimum while you do it. In other words, reduce your customer acquisition costs. Beyond the big benefit of streamlining their buying process and winning at the end of it, you can help make all sorts of business decisions that will resonate in your market. Everything from how you build your website to how you craft your contract. Pragmatics Market Class has a great quote to express this. So I'm gonna show you that today. It's the product team's job to connect the business to the buyers. I love that. It really distills what you're trying to do. There is so much that you can do if you bring the buyers to life within your organization so that you can respond with commercialization and sales activities that deliver the business you want as efficiently as possible. So much opportunity for insight, so many steps along the way, but the reality is trying to do all of this at once is gonna make your head explode. Not to mention your budget and your schedule and everybody around you. You can't gather every bit of knowledge on your buyers all at once, all the time. So how are you gonna make sure that every minute that you can and do spend on win loss will deliver value? that will impact your organization in a positive way? And how do you get the rest of the team to go along with it? Don't panic, plan. That's what today is gonna to be all about. I'm gonna give you some tools you need to perform win loss and get the most impact from your effort. To do that, we're gonna look at considerations to answer these five questions that you're seeing right now. First of all, who owns win loss? Where should you focus your win-loss research efforts? What questions should you ask to get the best information? How can you overcome the most typical roadblocks? And what do you do with the insights that you gather? 
the order of these questions is, is pretty intentional. In my experience leading and consulting product teams, the biggest win-loss roadblocks come from not asking some of these questions first before jumping into win-loss activities. Teams that skip these first couple questions really struggle with the later questions and frankly, completely bail on that last one. As I cover each one of these questions, you're gonna find in that workbook that Callie mentioned, and I hope you've all downloaded that, you're taking a look at it. You're gonna see this icon from time to time in that workbook, workshop it. The icon gives you specific questions to ask to plan your own win-loss next steps. Use your workbook to take notes now. We're gonna be moving way too fast for you to build your whole plan today in the workshop. But you have the tools in the workbook to do this at your convenience afterward. And then anytime you need a reset. All right, let's dive in. Where should you start? Most of you are doing win-loss analysis already, and that is wonderful. Don't stop. But you're going to get much better results if you answer a few questions about your goals and get that whole who owns what thing cleared up right away. I'm going to address both of these now. I'm going to start with who owns win-loss. This is a tough question, isn't it? And there can be a lot of reasons why teams are unclear or disagree on who owns win-loss. We could spend a whole day on how to create this alignment. For today, I'm going to arm you with the most important point about win-loss ownership. This is the perspective that every organization should be using to make the ownership decision, to answer that question, who owns win-loss? The perspective you should have is that it's not the people who do the interviews that own win-loss. It's whoever aggregates the interv interviews and knowledge, interprets, advises, and communicates the insights that are gathered. Let's take a closer look at that. There are, or should be, a lot of teams gathering facets of win-loss data. Sales and marketing are the ones we all think of, and they gather a lot of the valuable information, perhaps the lion's share. But there are insights on your website visitor tracking data. Chances are, if you've got outside sales partners, they've got some insights on win-loss. Your legal team, if they participate in contract negotiations, may also have some information you could use. I bet you can think of others too in your world. But doing the win-loss interviews is only half the battle. You have to combine all these sources together to find patterns and trends. You have to advise leadership on next steps based on those patterns and trends, and you need to prioritize the activities you take. You also need to communicate all of this to the organization so everybody can respond and do their jobs better. Should your legal team be the ones aggregating all this data and, data and looking for patterns and trends? Should sales sit down with the data scientists and figure out how to validate new findings? Or should each team just come to the planning meeting with each of their little slivers of data and argue about who's right? Clearly, none of those are the best solution. You will have many contributors to win-loss insights, but only one owner. At Innovate on Purpose, I recommend that this be the market strategist. Uh, whether or not you have this, the title market strategist in your organization, this is usually a senior level person in product management or product marketing management. In practice though, I don't care where this person sits in the organization. I don't care what their title is. I care that everyone knows what owning win-loss means and who that owner is. Whoever owns win-loss, owns aggregating the sources, prioritizing the information, making recommendations to leadership, and communicating win-loss knowledge and activities throughout the organization. It's a core responsibility of this person. Their evaluation, their, their bonus, any incentives and evaluation this person has, annual basis, whatever it might be, this would be part of it. We get really wrapped around the axle about who gathers win-loss information and almost none enabling the use of what's gathered. If an organization takes this perspective, follows this strategy, assigning roles gets a lot easier than you think. At a company I worked with uh, several years ago, the head of sales and I, and I was leading product and marketing at the time, 
we were totally aligned on ownership not really belonging to sales. This VP of sales wanted the sales team selling. Unfortunately, the sales team had felt like they had owned this for a long time and they didn't want to give it up. Now, the reality was they, they didn't really lead win loss or own it. They just liked taking customers' individual requests directly to IT and having them bolt on these one-off requests to whatever product was handy. The profits in this company were not up to expectations and the product integrity was very poor. There was a lot to unpack here, but we did two things together. The first one was, since sales wanted to own it and we didn't have owners at that time, we said, okay, here's what ownership means, you own it. The second thing we did was we created more visibility into the product roadmaps, what was getting built, what was sitting aside, all those things many customers wanted that weren't getting done because of the one-offs. It didn't take six months before the sales team came to their leader and said, look, we don't own this. We shouldn't own this. We don't own this. What they did say, though, was if they're going to own it, they have to listen to us because we're out in the field gathering knowledge. And that's very true. There are some pitfalls in, in even when people own it and everybody knows who own it, owns it. You have to hear those folks and you have to heed those folks. Remember, we're the aggregators. We're not the sole fount of knowledge either. Let's take a look at our first workshop at In the Workbook. When you get back to your real world, ask these questions. Who owns win loss today? Given what you know now, it might be nobody. Who should own it going forward? And if it's not your role to make this decision, ask your leader. Either way, you're going to want to get alignment across teams, especially marketing, product, sales, and probably other co another couple in your organization. And then, what steps can you personally take to help with a successful transition? The most important thing is to work together and make sure there's clear ownership, but also that there's clear contri contribution. Everybody's working together. Once ownership is sorted, great, wonderful. We know who owns it. We know who's contributing. That's great. But we still are left with a problem with having too many markets and buyers to learn about and not enough time to get to them all. A big theme in my practice from client after client is how do we focus our efforts to maximize our impact? Since you can't do win-loss in every market all at once, all the time, you need to find the buyers and markets where you'll get the most impact for your efforts. This is a quick two-step process and should take you about three minutes. You don't have to ask anybody about it until you get it done. You don't have to spend any money to do it. You're going to start by creating an inventory, a list of the markets and buyers you personally are responsible for understanding. The graphics here are spreadsheets we actually use in my practice and reflect an exercise done with an actual client. Maybe your focus is like Adam's here. He's responsible for win-loss insights on one product that's sold into a lot of markets. Alice, on the other hand, is responsible for all products sold to the law firm market. I refer to targets of research like markets and products as objects. So that's why this is called the object inventory worksheet. As I said, this usually takes a couple minutes, but if it doesn't, it's probably even more valuable. I worked with one client whose product marketing team filled these out, and when they compared them, they realized that three people were working on the same product in the same market, while one product had nobody assigned to it, even though it was one of their top three most critical strategic projects for the year. This simple step begins the process of focusing your win-loss efforts for maximum impact. First, you have to know what you're responsible for. Once you've created this list, you're going to prioritize it. You can do this any way you want, but I use impact and urgency on a one to five scale. You score impact by answering the question, how strategically important is this persona or market to our success? If this persona is the main buyer, as Pragmatic says, the target buyer, and maybe uh, this is somebody who is part of a critical market you're trying to go after, well, that's a five. If this is part of a declining market or maybe one of the secondary buyers, maybe it's a one or a two. Urgency scores size of your knowledge gap. All right, this is a really urgent persona, but we already know a lot about them. Uh, we've been dealing with them for years. They're very forthcoming with knowledge, whatever it is. Maybe you give them a one. 
Um, hey, my gap is not big, so I give it a one. Is my knowledge gap really big? I give it a five. Impact plus urgency prioritizes the markets or personas to focus on. In this case, looks like we're gonna focus on Sam, the business manager. This two-step process takes about five minutes. If we're gonna focus on Sam, who are you going to focus on? In your workbook, there's another placeholder for this. So this is a great thing to go back and do right away. What am I responsible for? And if I had to prioritize using urgency and impact, which buyer or market would I, would I prioritize? Even taking three minutes to go through this activity gives you knowledge to focus your efforts, but it also helps you explain to others why you're focusing on one buyer versus another. Everybody wants all the information all at once all the time. But they, like you, they understand that you've got limited time and you need to prioritize if you can show them why. Here's another benefit. You can even help them focus their win-loss contributions with this rationale. Focusing a whole team allows you to learn collectively and feed on the best practices of each other and gather more knowledge faster so you can move on to the next persona and the next. That sounds pretty good. For most of you, revisiting this focus every quarter will give you powerful win-loss analysis without letting any one persona or, or market get too stale. You've honed in on where you're going to focus your win-loss activities. So the next step is going to be what are you going to ask? What questions are going to get you what you need? Now, the good news is with doing those first steps, you're already ahead of the game because you can focus on a few buyers and personas, I'm sorry, buyers and markets now versus everybody you're responsible for. From here, it's a lot easier to get some precise, powerful questions to get insights you need to win. We just identified, or I'm sorry, we just identified the buyer and markets you're focused on. Let's take it one more step before we start brainstorming questions. For each buyer, it's going to be helpful to know where in the buying workflow they're going to show up. So I've used here a basic buyer journey progression to structure this thinking. My buyer, Sam, the business manager. She goes through these buying phases, need awareness, buying trigger, et cetera. What are the most critical gaps in my knowledge of Sam in each of these phases? I use this to structure discussions with my clients because it just helps you go through the progression and identify the gaps at a little bit more level, of, a little more granular detail than we did before. You may know a lot about a couple of these phases. If sales has been doing most of your win-loss, you probably know a lot about option evaluation and negotiation, where sales is usually leading the effort. But maybe you don't know anything about what triggers Sam to start looking for a solution. If it's a relatively new buyer you're trying to understand, the first step might be to validate the phases of the buying process itself. Do these actually happen? And is Sam actually involved? Sometimes I've done this step and it takes five minutes. Uh, sometimes it takes a day. It depends on how aligned and informed you currently are on your buyers and how they buy. Either way, this time saves days, if not weeks of meetings. Again, justifying a focus to deliver impactful knowledge. Now that you have your list of knowledge gaps, you should prioritize these knowledge gaps as well. You can use the same impact and urgency score I just gave you. Which buyers and markets to start with? Which knowledge gaps to start with? Whatever you use, keep it simple. For each knowledge gap, ask yourself three questions. First, what's the question I need to ask to fill this knowledge gap? More on creating questions in a minute. Second, who can I get the answer from? Sam might not be the best person to ask. Or maybe Sam is the best person to ask, but you can't get to Sam. Now, it's not perfect, but maybe there's somebody else you'll have to ask before you can even get to Sam. Maybe, maybe an analyst has already done research and you can get Sam's answer right there. Third, how should I ask this person? Mode of outreach matters. Nobody in the United States answers their phone unless they know who's calling. In Germany, they answer their phones. In the Netherlands, they answer their phones, not Americans. So calling in Munich, good. Calling in Muncie, Indiana, bad. But B2B buyers aren't gonna to wanna to be approached through Facebook or their personal Gmail or any sort of generic survey. So stick to B2B emailing. 
marketing, whether it's uh, Google Enterprise or Outlook, whatever you're using. LinkedIn, any associations they belong to, those are other good places to go to get access. Match the access to the access this buyer is going to respond to. How are you going to know if you've got the right questions and you're asking them in the right venue? Discovery and validation. Anybody who's taken a pragmatic class has heard that before. What that means is test and learn. Now you're doing that though consciously, specifically, rather than in a, in a big sort of general panic. The beauty is with this little bit of planning, you can create win-loss questions. The buyers actually want to answer. This workflow has focused your effort to gain as much detailed knowledge as possible. Now, the typical win-loss questions here on the left-hand side, they're not bad or wrong. They're good to begin a discussion, but ask them too often, and your buyers are going to wonder if you've done any homework. Get specific as quickly as you can to gather better and better information and get more detailed engagement from your buyers. Here's one from a client of mine from several years ago. An analyst group had convinced them and everybody in their industry, they built security software, that their reports were the factor on which their buyers bought. They looked at the report, they saw who was number one, that was it. My client spent a huge amount of time preparing analyst communications and they had a whole team de dedicated to analyst relations. When they did win loss to validate this specifically, what they discovered was that those reports were something buyers might read. They were interesting and you didn't want to be at the very bottom, but it didn't figure highly into the actual buying decision. What you learn and the questions you ask are going to be different. Everybody's not only industry, but company. You have different goals, different objectives, different priorities. So I want you to workshop this. Use these ideas to workshop a few good questions and ways of finding the answer to fill your most important gaps. By the way, just to tie back to something we've already talked about, you're almost certainly going to discover that not all of these questions should be asked by a single team or person, but rather multiple contributors. Uh, this is also going to come in handy later when we start giving, getting into some specifics about how to get this information from people who might not want to talk. I hope this is sounding good, but there are still some obstacles in the way of success, aren't there? Let's talk about these obstacles. Both pragmatic and my research show that most teams get hung up on the same obstacles to successful win-loss analysis. If you took our pre-workshop survey on LinkedIn, you saw two of the biggies were lack of time and getting customers to talk. By the way, for those of you who did that survey, thank you. It was just great. These were things that we felt were true. We had some data, but it was great to have the up to the minute. Overall, we hear, I don't know who to ask. I don't know where to start. I don't have any time. I can't get access and nobody will talk to me. We've already covered the first two by prioritizing where to start and identifying the knowledge gaps. So you've got the foundation ready to go. Let's move on to the issues of no time to do work, getting blocked by internal teams, and getting buyers to talk to you. No time, make time. That's harsh, isn't it? That's kind of just flippant. And I don't mean it to be, but I want to start out by, by asking you these questions. If you're losing deals and you don't know why, what could be more important than learning why? If you're freaking out because there's a new free alternative to your paid product and you don't know what your next move should be, what could be more important than finding out? If your market has changed the way they want to buy and you don't know how to change with it, now well, you get the idea. If win-loss analysis will give you insights you need to win more, prioritize it. But if you can't answer the question, uh, why are we doing win-loss analysis anyway? In 10 words and 20 seconds. Stop doing win-loss analysis and find the answer to that question. Maybe you're doing an activity that is not even a priority for you right now, just because you think you should do it, just because you always have. There's no time because you're trying to do so much. So action step number one here is to ask yourselves, what are you trying to accomplish? We already did that. We already know. And if you haven't answered that question, answer it. Because that will hone in. You can find the right amount of time to prioritize number one 
maybe number one and two. Here are a few more time savers that have worked with my clients. So first one is what I call opportunistic win-loss interviews. This is a way to tuck win-loss questions into every part of the buyer's ongoing workflow. For example, a one-question survey for the first-time visitors to your website. What brought you to our site today? Maybe sales can ask the question in their pitch meetings. Uh, could each of you introduce yourself and share your role in the buying process? This leverages everyone that touches the buyer in a concentrated effort to fill knowledge gaps. Now, of course, you're only filling those knowledge gaps if all that knowledge is getting centralized. Remember, the owner centralizes. Start with 15 minutes each week. Nobody's going to notice if everything you do is 15 minutes later than it was. So don't tack this onto your day. You're probably already working way too many hours. But go back and put 15 minutes on your calendar for the next six weeks. Devote it to win-loss analysis and start where I started. Start by listing what you're responsible for, prioritizing your personas and markets, and then creating a list of knowledge gaps. That'll probably take one or maybe two, and then you've got four whole 15 minutes. You've got a whole hour to do something. Hopefully, as you go forward with this focus, you'll find that you can create more time. As we go through the rest of our process, I, I hope to find you a little bit more. So do workshop this. Now, what if somebody in your own organization is blocking your ability to speak directly with the market? We can be our own worst enemies. Don't talk to my customers. Hey, you know what? Sales is getting that information or sales can give you everything that you need. They're out there in the market. This usually happens when there's confusion over who owns win-loss and what ownership means. But once that's clarified, you still need to create that ownership and a comfort level in your organization with that ownership. I'm using sales as an example. I just want to be clear. It's not always sales saying, don't talk to my customers. It's just the most common and frequent scenario that we hear, which is why I use it. There could be many other challenges. But the best way to handle this particular challenge is to leave it be. Let it go. Say, okay, fine. You bring back the insight for me. I'm serious. But also remember that they don't really want to own win-loss. There are a couple of things they need from this process, but they don't really want to own it. They'd actually like you to own it. So here's what you need to do to build that bridge. First of all, give your sales team a priority list of knowledge gaps you need to fill. They probably have a couple of those too. And then ask them. Yes, ask them to fill those specifically. Share the impact that you expect this insight to have on their life and the organization's success. Uh, hey, uh, customers in New Zealand aren't renewing at acceptable levels. We need to find out why so we can turn that around. People want to know why they're doing things. Give credit when they do bring you the information, even if you don't do anything with it, even if you say, you know what, we're not going to act. Acknowledging that you've got it, saying what you did with it and thanking them by name if possible. And again, not just sales, everybody. I once did this in an all hands meeting. It, again, several years ago, I shared an example of how there were a couple reps who had helped marketing uncover some important buying patterns in specifically the small law market that we were trying to open up. I had them get up. I said, hey, so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so, stand up for some applause. They got up, they got a round of applause. Their VP told me later that they were floored. No one had ever thanked them or showed them the, the, the link between all that information they gave to marketing and what we did with it. It was better than giving them an incentive bonus to do it. Recognition goes a long way and holding yourself accountable for not just asking for information, but using it. We'll get to that in a bit. Meanwhile, you're going to go about your business, not only going out to the market and filling gaps that you're filling but aggregating that knowledge with all the inputs. Define your quarterly priorities and report on your progress, including who's helping and who's not. If any group isn't doing their part, it'll be apparent quickly and it can be remedied. Now the big one. How do you get customers to talk to you, especially those who bought from your competition? I've been gathering this information from, from pragmatic classes, from Innovate on Purpose workshops for a decade. 
And I'll give you some tips specifically on what your peers have said over that time period that have worked for them. There are some very strong themes here. So that's what I'm sharing with you today. First one, never forget it's a numbers game. You're gonna to have to reach out to a lot of buyers who won't even acknowledge that you've gotten in touch with them. My informal polls over this time has said for tech companies, you're gonna to have to reach out to between five and 25 people for every win interview you'll get. To try to get a hold of a competitor's customer on a loss interview, it's more like 25 to 75. Don't get, don't get daunted, this will take time. There are other ways to get around that, but that's a really good thing just to remember, set some expectations. Number two, do be opportunistic. Remember what I said about those opportunistic interview questions throughout the buying process. You do not have to wait until the buying is finished if you do this properly. So you don't want to derail a sale, but could sales ask some questions, bring back some information? Could their path through your website be giving you more knowledge, what they download, what they don't download? Where else could you tuck in some questions? This is one of those things that people who won't do an interview after they've bought will answer one question at a time over a six month period as they go through a process. They don't even know they're doing a win-loss interview if you do it this way. Number three, boring questions, boring answers. You need specific insights, but ask your questions in a way that opens them up. What do we all like to talk about? Well, of course, we all like to talk about ourselves, but we love to give our opinion. We like to predict. We like to tell other people how to prioritize. We like to give advice. And we like to talk about what frustrates us. Find specific add-ons to what frustrates you most about this. Hey, uh, if you were us, how would you advise we do that? You'll get better answers to questions they can sink their teeth into. The second best tip I've ever heard is to ask for the 10 minute meeting. Not 30, not even 15, 10. Companies, I've, I've heard one individual say, it's like a throwdown. They don't believe it's possible for you to ask questions and then shut up in 10 minutes. Prove you can. I've had student after student and client after client tell me, if you ask for 10 and you respect the 10, have three questions ready, ask as many of them as you can, stop at 10 and say, our time is up. But if you have a few more moments, I certainly have a few more questions I'd love to talk to you about. What I have heard over the past years of asking this from your peers is, if you ask that question at 10 minutes, half the time, you will get more of an interview. That's pretty powerful. Now here's a bonus. This is the single most recurring piece of advice I have seen and heard. Never underestimate the power of a gift card. It doesn't matter if your buyers are executives. It doesn't matter if they're scientists. For years, I've asked students in class if any of them had success with gift cards. And there's always one that really surprises me. Doctors, lawyers, CFOs, heads of companies. It doesn't matter. If your buyers are not barred by law or regulation from taking gift cards, give it a try. You might be shocked at what you discover. In general, what I hear from the market is any interview that you think you might need to get a little more uh, response rate from, $50. If you want an hour of somebody's time, you want them to come to a focus group, somewhere between one and 500, depending on the factors you would probably know. You can always give the gift card to charity if you think that will go better. But what I've heard over and over again is, if it's not barred by law, try giving them the money first. They may say they want to give it to charity, but they really want to get it themselves. All right, workshopping this. Which one of these will you try? Is there anything here you haven't tried that you want to experiment with in the next quarter. That would be a great thing to put in your workbook. Now, the really sad thing about all of this, about this lack of time, this lack of budget, this, this lack of organization is, even with all the efforts we're doing today, half of us aren't using it. 50% of you said in our survey that you don't use what you gather. 
I see this a lot. I worked with a client years ago on competitive positioning, and they had done some win-loss interviews about six months before I came on board, and they gave them to me to read. These interviews included a couple of very pointed suggestions about their pricing tiers and bundles that they could have acted on. So I asked them, what were the next steps that you had taken and what have you seen? They freely admitted that after presenting the data at the quarterly all hands meeting, nobody actually did anything to respond to it. Not even consciously say, we're not going to do anything. Doing win-loss interviews is what we focus on. Responding to the knowledge we gather is practically an afterthought. And that's really the most important part. For those of you who are Seinfeld fans, I'm gonna paraphrase a classic episode where Jerry is renting a car. I know you know how to do the interviews, but anybody can just do them. We gotta use them. Here are the tips that I gave that client and others to help with this final piece. Number one, allocate time to communicate. Yep, you gotta allocate more time, even though you're already strapped for time. And I, I've been in your shoes and I've been in your boss's shoes. I know you don't have a lot of time. But remember, there is no point wasting time doing interviews if you're not going to use them. So a portion of whatever time you put in your schedule, maybe it's 15 minutes, maybe it's an hour, maybe it's a little more. A portion of that has to be allocated to communication. As an executive who's been in charge of many market research budgets, I can tell you, you're never going to get more funding if you aren't showing that you're acting on the activities you're already doing. This is an, an unsaid but very constant tension between executives and marketing and, and product teams. We don't have time, we don't have budgets, we need more. And the leadership team says, well, no, I'm not seeing what I need from what you're already doing. This is what they're talking about. This investment in time to communicate is going to help you get more time, budget, and resources to do more win-loss, to communicate more, and to win more. It's a virtuous cycle. Communicate for impact. The watchword here is precision. Write information to the right team. Legal needs this information. They need to know what terms and conditions are slowing negotiations down. The team that's your enterprise sales team, they need specific insights on larger customers. Probably your telesales team or new business may be smaller. Give them something they can act on. And since you don't have extra time, always remember nobody else does either. I, nobody is actually looking at you and saying, now they're busy. Uh, well, I don't have anything to do, but boy, they're busy. We all have too much to do. Everybody's stretched. So fold these win-loss insights into other meetings. I, I used to talk, tell my teams, act like a pilot fish. Glide along in the draft of other meetings. Then you're not the one who's setting up all the meetings. You're the one who's giving good information at the meetings that already exist. That client I just talked about a moment ago, uh, here's what we ended up doing with them. Here are three things they decided to do. First of all, at their quarterly all hands meetings, from then on, what they did was they gave a brief update on what had changed in the buyer landscape. Was somebody else sitting in later? Uh, was there more influence from an analyst report? Were we seeing this competitor on the horizon that we didn't really think was a competitor? They also created videos, one video for each one of their sales teams. The sales team was a really brief video, one for each. It gave them specific actionable knowledge about buyers and how they buy. They used it for onboarding new sales reps, but it was also available 24 seven whenever a rep just felt like, I need a quick refresher on that buyer. Then they printed these buyer business cards, things you could tuck in the back of your phone or a wallet. They gave some key questions and buying patterns of each buyer. Um, some of those might be right for you and some of them won't be, but before you create a communication plan, think of your internal teams as audiences that you need to convince and speak their language. The last section of your workbook has a spot for you to brainstorm and to communicate in a way that works for you. So that's what I want you to do next. Who needs win-loss insights? Make a list. What do they need? And, and how can you get them to them? Is there, is there a report or a, a Teams channel? Is there someplace where they're already looking for information that you could just put that information there? And always check, am I, am I allowing time to communicate? 
If it's been a few weeks or a few months, put some time in. This is a lot to pack into an hour, isn't it? But just remember this is a process. I, I love what Winston Churchill said, success is never final, but failure is never fatal. And it's the courage to continue that counts. This is a, a layered process. You cannot do everything at once, so don't. But do prioritize for impact. Another good quote for right now is from James Taylor. You've got a friend. As a matter of fact, you've got a lot of friends. Uh, a couple things I want to highlight before we go to Q&A. Pragmatic courses, definitely the gold standard for product managers and marketers to certify. I've taught these classes for six years. This was a destination job for me. I, I was loving what I was doing. It was just too good not to do. So I do advocate for these courses. I would always recommend and, and I know I and the other instructors would love to see you there. If after this hour, you're feeling, feeling breathless and you'd like a, a team session, a private workshop to spend more time actually putting together your plan, I have an Innovate on Purpose discount for you. And so the, the discount code 20% off my workshops, and you find those at Innovate on Purpose. They're, it's a separate company from, from Pragmatic Institute, PMC20. And Kelly's going to post that in the chat for you as well. And so you can contact me or go to my site. And if you see anything there that's interesting, you can use that code. Let's get into Q&A, though. It's been a real pleasure being here. This is a topic that is very near and dear to my heart. Callie, do we have any questions? Well, Diane, I mean, first off, what a tremendous, tremendous presentation. I mean, I, I think everything from pulling from those, those real world case studies, right, those workshopping prompts, uh, it's just such a nice job of breaking down the process um, and, and really helping folks understand sort of those, those action steps. So uh, yes, we do. We do have many questions. Um, I've been keeping an eye on our Q&A box. I also uh, received a couple sent my way, but um, one of the ones I had here was, can you talk a little bit about your, your email template, right? You talk about reaching out to that customer to to request an interview and making it a 10 minute meeting. Is there maybe a formula you use or an example you use when developing that out? Good question. And, and I would say it's less of a formula than elements I would include because most industries are so different. The tone of voice you're gonna use is very different. Uh, I work with a lot of subscription businesses and a lot of those are consumer based. Uh, I got one the other day that said, if, um, if you don't have seven minutes, which I thought, whoa, real throw down, seven minutes. If you don't have seven minutes to spend with me, just uh, spew your stream of invective and go on about your day. And I thought, wow, okay, that was kind of funny. It was really informal. You would never use that if you were uh, trying to get law firms or CFOs to talk to you. Here's what I would do. I would ask a very intriguing uh, question in the subject line. When you're trying to get a hold of these folks, you're going to want a question that they want to answer. So can you put that right in the subject line? Um, are you really are you really acting on these analyst reports? Um, are you are you really the least important buyer in the room? I mean, those are the kinds of things that that, that we've done in the past. I've brainstormed with clients before. So that headline might well be the question. You might also want to include in that. 10 minutes to talk about that, something that, that indicates I want a real short amount of time. Be open to when they're available. That's another piece that I would say, be open to when they're available. Here's a piece I didn't mention in the, in the workshop. And this goes for every piece of information you gather from anybody. It doesn't have to be gathered your way. So if you send out this email and they don't wanna talk to you, some people, don't like to talk to people, they just don't. Maybe though, they would send you an email. Maybe they would type something into chat. It depends on who you are. Sales is the same way. I learned through very bitter experience, nobody's gonna fill out a form. They're not, they're not gonna fill out a form. Your customer might actually fill out a form, but it doesn't matter how you get the information as long as you get the information. So that would be another piece that I would put in. Finally, keep it as short as possible. Yep. Yeah, and it seems like there's a common theme here, right? We've heard from a, from a lot of attendees about, about sales, right? And 
maybe uh, being told to not include them in the process or, or even hearing from them that, that win-loss isn't valuable from your sales team. Um, so how do, you, how do you counter to that? How do you utilize sales in a way that's most effective? The most effective way to use sales is going to be to let them give you the information that they have. Sales gathers a lot of really valuable information. They don't gather everything. But the first step is to tell them what your focus is and why and bring them into that process. Let's agree on what the focus is, what the priorities are to learn. Then they can target their efforts. They don't feel like, hey, you just want me to do a win-loss analysis every time I talk to somebody. I know what I'm trying to get this quarter. I know what I'm trying to get next quarter. And by the way, you're keeping track of this. You're reporting on it and you're doing something with it. So it's not just this one-way stream of knowledge. Too often, we're not holding up our end of the bargain by telling them what we're doing with it and why we need it. So that's a piece I would make sure I had. I know, and I, I see Mike's question here, and I was I wanted to save it for the end, but I say we just get into it. Why not? So, uh, you know, we talk about like those those questions, right? The, maybe what are some questions that nobody asks and everybody should be asking in win loss? How can we get you know really punchy, data driven responses we can utilize? The questions that nobody asks and everybody should in win loss interviews. Mm-hmm. I have I feel a few favorites. Um, One of them, like right at the beginning of the process, we never ask this, what triggered you to buy now and not before? And my earliest realization that this was a valuable question was when I was a director of product many, many years ago, and we started asking this question. What we discovered, it was was software for lawyers and law firms. And what we discovered was that all law firms had the same problems. They all wanted the same things, no matter how big or small they were, but they didn't have any money to buy anything until right about the time they had five attorneys in the law firm. Not five employees, but five attorneys. Once we realized that we were able to change a lot of the awareness building that we did, where we were present, what we were doing to bring people in, the messaging shifted and we started accelerating. We didn't pay a lot of attention to law firms that had one or two attorneys. When they got five, we did a very concentrated marketing effort, active marketing, and it paid off. Oh, yeah. yeah, you want more questions than that. So that's one of them. Um, ah, let's see here. What's the single reason you bought from us and not from them? Because this might not be your product. Too often we, we get bogged in features, but it might be because your pricing model was really horrible for me. It just didn't work. It might be, you know what? You people are nasty people. Everybody's nasty. Your marketing's nasty. Your salespeople, everybody's nasty. That actually happened to me once when we did win-loss analysis. We discovered that we against this other large competitor, there was one nice company to deal with and we were not it. Now that's not a very good thing to find out, but it was helpful. I think that's, I can't remember the other one. So let's go with that. I love it, Diane. That's great. And I actually have two Annas uh, who have questions in in the uh, Q&A box here. But, you know, kind of talking about gathering that information gathering, right? And I think, um, you know, Anna says a, a lot of like our larger customers are willing to talk and be interviewed and share. But how do you kind of pull out from those smaller companies that that relevant information you need? The smaller companies actually are usually, and and again, this is what I hear. This is not necessarily what everybody hears. What I hear is that the smaller companies are often very susceptible, susceptible, very open to gift cards. They like a gift card even more. It tends to be a little less formal. Be where they are. So the smaller companies, they're very strapped for time too. Their resources are very constrained. And also ask what's unique about them. I mean, especially if you're trying to figure out from those smaller companies whether or not you are going to be able to sell to them at all. Willingness to pay, if you've taken pragmatic classes, willingness to pay is often not really willingness, but ability. And sometimes small companies where we think, but we know they need this. Well, they might. But what you might want to be asking there specifically is is through action, through questions and through observation, can they actually afford to buy? Mm-hmm. Diane, I had an interesting one here that I wanted to toss you that came to me privately. Um, what happens when you just launched a product, but you don't have any buyers yet? Um, how would you suggest going about win-loss in, in that area? 
you know, that's tough, isn't it? Because you really need win-loss in order to find that buyer's experience, find out who's involved. The best thing to do is to begin with the pieces of the process that are happening. So focus your questions on the steps your prospects are taking now and ask them what's working and what isn't. So you're building a win-loss narrative as your buyers are buying. And, and here's one of the very best things you can do when you launch a product, sit in on your sales team's pipeline meetings. Be there for a lot of reasons. They might informally say something that you would never think to ask them. You'll see where the deals are in the pipeline. You might find out where they're getting stuck and you might be able to proactively point out that pattern and say, let's take a look at that. I had that happen several years ago. We had this incredible product. It was the first product I was ever part of. It was very lucky. And it was sailing through qualification, presentation. The price was right. The product was compelling. And the deals weren't closing. And after seeing this, this group of deals just clump up and, and hang around in the pipeline, we got together and we did some spot investigation. And what we realized was this 27-page contract we had, our legal department had gone a little crazy, was kind of causing a problem getting this thing closed. We hammered out a contract with legal that was four pages long, still humiliating, but better than 27 pages. We resent out the contracts and within three months, and some of these deals had been in that pipeline 18 months. Within three months, 90% of those deals closed. It's not always that wonderful, but that was a good example of why that investment is, is good. Get with your sales team, ask the pipeline. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's an amazing uh, outcome. That's awesome. We all hope that that's, that happens time and time again. It was, it was a good one. <laughs> Um, how about gathering qualitative information and how do you, how can you utilize that to make it into a quantitative? You know, qualitative information is what you need to gather before you do the quantitative. At Pragmatic Institute, we call that discovery and validation. Discovery is you don't know what you don't know. And so you're trying to hear something new. A lot of win-loss analysis interviews are that discovery and they should be. Don't ask validation questions in your interviews because that's nothing bores an interviewee faster than asking those questions. Use that, use those um, um, validation questions in surveys, uh, in, in other methods that are, that are easier, faster, cheaper, quantifiable. But here, you do still have to ask a question that's specific enough in that quantifiable or that qualitative information to get something useful. So always ask open-ended high gain questions, plan some questions. They don't have to be exact. You don't have to read them, but plan them, tie them to what you're trying to find out. Let people talk, don't solve. That's the thing I hear from my students in classes most often is they say, I, 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 I had to solve. I just, I was jumping to the solution. So were they. Too often you'll hear from a client during this discovery, build me this. Ask them why. What do you hope that a building of that thing will do for you? What is the problem you're trying to solve? Because that's what you're really looking for. And dig. Five whys in a win-loss. One more story on that. Uh, again, this is back to a uh, background where I was consulting with the, the company I had once worked with. They were trying to figure out why small law firms were not renewing this product and large law firms were. But the very few small law firms that were renewing it loved it, would not let it go, didn't care what it cost, no negotiation. I went out on the road with a, a product manager who worked for me, and she was asking great questions. What she discovered just by saying, tell me more, tell me more about that. Oh, explain that to me, was the original intent of this product, what it was designed to do was help with trial preparation, was not what the small law firms were using it for. And I won't go into it, but they were using it for sales leads. Uh, client leads. Once we realized that, we were able to shut off pieces of this project product, charge the same amount of money for it. The original renewal rate on this product when I took it over was 8%. 8, not 80, 8. As she started to dig into this and ask the right questions, what she discovered was we did some surveys, we did the qualitative after we learned all this, she switched that from 8% after three years, it was 
80, I wish I'd been, I was gone by then, but I really wish I'd hung around because it was a good thing. There's always something to be learned from win-loss analysis. What do you need to learn the most about? What, what is the most important thing for you to learn that will have the most impact on your ability to succeed? Focus there and the rest will take care of itself. Diane, so great. This, this was such a terrific conversation. I love that I, I get to learn alongside everybody. And, um, you know, I, I'm just really excited. I, you know, as, as I mentioned to everybody, you know, we have hit our time, but if you are looking for more guidance on your win-loss process, do be sure to reach out to Diane. Mention that PMC20 reference code um, that is exclusive to our conversation today. So um, I know that that does it. Diane, thank you so much for taking the time to share your brilliance with us. Um, it was so great to craft this session, and I did want to do a quick plug to anybody who's looking to learn a little bit more about Pragmatic, right? Um, I want to kind of tell you a little bit about our training. You can check that out here. Um, in the meantime, uh, we're so excited that you got to dig into the community a little bit and be our guest here, folks. Uh, we do hope to see some new faces in the community soon, and uh, take care, all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.